Good morning. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Also, we'd like to uh, uh, welcome Pastor Lisa Reynolds has been appointed to Bethany for another year. And also today is Juneteenth, which refers to June 19th, 1865, the day enslaved African Americans were finally emancipated in every part of the United States. Let us also remember, none of us are free till all are free. Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and welcome to Bethany on this Father's Day and the 6th, 3rd Sunday after Pentecost. Um, it's good to be back after annual conference. We had a, a very busy annual conference. I hope you all were following along on the conference website and are up to date on all the news. Um, lots of, we had a lot of fun. We really did. Um, I was thinking there was something else I wanted to say, but maybe not. <laughs> Please stand as you are able and join in our call to worship. Welcome disciples of Jesus Christ. Is anything too wonderful for our God? Nothing is too wonderful for God who loves and saves us. We celebrate God who promised Abraham a multitude of descendants and then visited Abraham at his home to announce that the promise would be fulfilled. Nothing is too wonderful for God who makes and fulfills promises. 
We remember the compassion of Jesus, who noticed his neighbor's illnesses and distress and acted to bring them healing and wholeness. Nothing is too wonderful for God who heals and restores the distressed. We remember the invitation of the Spirit to participate in God's compassionate community building. Nothing is too wonderful for God who empowers us to transform strangers into friends and members of our community through active love, invitation, and welcome. Let us worship God together, receiving the promises, compassion, and invitation to be disciples of Christ whom God uses to transform our families, our neighborhoods, and our world. Because nothing is too wonderful for our God. Uh, please join me now, turn in your hymnal to 159, and let us sing, Lift High the Cross.
God of redemption, summon us to Sarah's joy, Abraham's wonder, and Paul's confident hope through the word and work of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Her epistle lesson comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Old Testament lesson is from Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 through 15, and chapter 21, verses 1 through, 17, through 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 10, 8. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over un... Nope, that's not where it started. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, <coughs> Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother, Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, lepers cast out demons. You received without payment, Give without payment. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Pray with me, please. God of unlimited grace, open our minds to hear and take to heart the inconceivably expansive love you have for all of your creation, even your children who are not like us. May we learn to obey your will and share your compassionate love just as Jesus did. Amen. Um, this is not the sermon I thought I was going to write. Just, that's just a warning. When I prepared the bulletin for today, I didn't know I was about to attend a historic annual conference. I believe that most of you should now know that on Thursday, our clergy executive session voted to ordain an individual who during the ordination interviews, disclosed that they were legally joined in a same-sex civil union. Now, I imagine some of you are wondering why the clergy session broke the rules that were in place to prevent the ordination of a self-avowed practicing homosexual. And the short answer is, we didn't break the rules. It turns out that in our United Methodist Constitution, paragraph 33, article 2, states that the annual conference is the basic body in the church and as such shall have reserved to it the right to vote on all constitutional amendments, on all matters relating to the character and and conference relations of its clergy members and on the ordination of clergy, with the exception that the lay members may not vote on matters of ordination, character, and conference relations of clergy. 
So on matters of ordination, our Constitution grants the grants power to the clergy of each annual conference, the right to discern among their own candidates which individuals possess the gifts and graces to lead congregations in fruitful ministry. No outside authority may force our annual conference to ordain or not to ordain any individual. Yes, there is language elsewhere in our Book of Discipline that expressly prohibits the ordination of members of the LGBTQ plus community. But according to an individual well versed in adjudicating the nuances of our Constitution and discipline, the powers granted to the annual conferences by the Constitution supersede non constitutional limitations. I imagine we're going to hear more about that in the days ahead. But for today, I want us to consider our texts in light of this historic moment in our conference and our life together as United Methodists. In Genesis, the triune God visits Abraham in the form of three angels. Abraham invites them to sit, rest, and enjoy a meal, which he then hurries to Sarah and tells her to prepare. And you know what happens. One of the three angels tells Abraham that Sarah will bear a child. And Sarah overhears the angel guest and laughs. But not with joy, right? Sarah didn't jump for joy and skip a happy dance. She did not clap her hands and say, finally, after all these years of miracle baby, God is so good. No, we know Sarah's reaction and I paraphrase. After all these years, when my husband's almost a hundred and I am a way past childbearing. Ha, yeah, right. <laughs> God's angel representatives were not pleased. And yet, a year later, Sarah gave birth to Isaac. God's promise was fulfilled and Sarah truly laughed with joy. Now, here's another of my little word nerd moments. The Hebrew translation, the name Isaac means laughter and it's derived from that verb's root. But the difference for Sarah, you understand, Sarah, was that her family and friends would no longer laugh derisively at her for being barren. Instead, they would laugh for joy with her. Who would ever have imagined that Sarah, the barren one, would conceive and bear a healthy heir to her 100-year-old husband, Abraham? Nothing, according to the angels, nothing is too wonderful for God. And we know that, right? I'm not going to take time now to reiterate the wonderful acts of God which led to Jesus' birth and resurrection. We can simply say again and again, nothing is too wonderful for God. But what about our text today with Jesus sending his disciples out to proclaim the good news, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons? Well, all that is well and good, but did you hear what he said first? Jesus said, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. And now we might be inclined to think that Jesus was actually instructing his disciples to be picky about who would receive the good news, who would receive healing. 
go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Maybe Jesus put boundaries on the disciples' first foray into healing so that they would be among their own people and maybe more comfortable. Or maybe he just wanted to keep them close by so he could keep an eye on them. But we don't know. What we do know is that after his resurrection, Jesus told these same disciples, the 11, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, all nations. And we are the grateful recipients of the disciples' obedience to Jesus' command. Otherwise, we wouldn't be Christians. If the good news hadn't escaped the bounds of Judaism, if the persecutor Saul hadn't been claimed by Jesus, if the Jews, Jew, Saul, now Paul, hadn't become the apostle to the Gentiles, where would we be today? Jesus broke the conventional boundaries of his day. He talked to and healed lepers. He had compassion for that poor man who had wrestled with demons all his life and lived among the tombs near the east bank of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus saw and loved the people whom self-respecting and proper God-fearers avoided whether out of fear of contamination or contempt. Jesus saw the outcasts and loved them. He saw the image of God within them. He knew that they were God's beloved children, despite society's prejudicial beliefs about them. And friends, Jesus' compassionate love is now our task. That's what it means to follow Jesus. We must always be learning and growing through prayer and Christian education and conferencing so that we begin to see as God sees and love as God loves. In Acts 8, we see that Jesus' disciples did succeed in the mission Jesus gave them, though they too had prejudices to overcome. Picking up with verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the enemies of the Jews, the people who worshiped God the wrong way. Then an angel of the Lord sent Philip to the wilderness road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And there he met an Ethiopian eunuch who was in charge of the Ethiopian queen's treasury. Philip explained a passage in Isaiah pertaining to Jesus. And when the man understood it, he asked Philip to baptize him. And Philip agreed. Now the fact that we are not gasping at the idea that an Ethiopian eunuch would ask to be baptized or that Philip would agree to baptize him. It's just, it just proves how little we understand the context of what's happening in our Bible. The Ethiopian eunuch was a Gentile, a foreigner, and as a eunuch, his body had been altered in a way that was unacceptable to faithful God worshipers. 
but Philip saw the man, saw that his curiosity was genuine. And as Philip taught him, the man's heart was open to the Lord. Philip had compassion for the Ethiopian eunuch and baptized him because Philip could see that he was filled with love and faith in Jesus, that that faith had taken root in his heart. Finally, in Acts 10, a God-fearing Gentile named Cornelius received word from God during prayer to seek out Peter and Peter also received word from God in a dream, quote, what God has made clean, you must not profane. So after they met, Peter baptized Cornelius and all of his household. Now what's really interesting, and you should go home and pick up Acts chapter 10 and read through it, this story is told and then retold in Acts 10. And I've told you before, and I'll say it again, if something is told more than one time, if it's repeated in the Bible, it's because the biblical authors did not want us to miss the importance of this. We have to pay close attention to stories like this that are repeated. And then in chapter 11, Peter has gone back to Jerusalem and must defend his actions to the disciples there. And so the story is told a third time. We, this generation, we are not the first people who need convincing that God calls, saves, and pours out the Holy Spirit on people we could we would consider undeserving of those gifts and graces. But we have this biblical testimony to tell us that it is so. Finally, as he defends himself, Peter says to the disciples, if then God gave them, Cornelius and his household, the same gift, that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? It's a question we all should be asking ourselves. When we resist God's call in another human being, we might want to reread this. Who are we to resist? What's, what struck me about this was that what we see here is awe, humility, compassion, and obedience in Peter. Peter, you know, who acts first and thinks later. But he was overcome by this experience. And Jesus knew that he had this capacity and made him the rock upon, he would build the ch upon whom he would build the church. Who are we that we should hinder the outpouring of God's grace on any person? And so I pray that we, like Philip, may become people who can see with God's heart the image of God in every person. And like Peter, may we celebrate with joy God's outpouring of love upon a wide and diverse population. May our minds and our imaginations be open to the breadth and length and height and depth of God's miraculously transformative love that we may finally see all the people with the compassionate love of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Our hymn of response is, turn the bulletin over, 
Number 505 in your hymnal, When Our Confidence is Shaken. This might be a new hymn for you. We'll sing stanzas one, three, and four. Please stand as you are able. of faith found at page 881 in your hymnal, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to a time of sharing our joys and concerns. And I would like to go ahead and name that if anybody is having um, uneasiness or questions about the actions that were taken at annual conference, please feel free to get in touch with me. I would love to talk with you about it. And uh, I don't know where, we'll, where our conversations would go, but I would be happy to talk with anyone who is um, unsettled about this. <coughs> um, joys and concerns. Anybody? My grandma Mary is back in the hospital um, with some heart problems. They don't know what's wrong. So prayers for her, for the doctors, and for her family, please. We have a number of family members coming back <clears throat> from the beach right now. The visibility in Brunswick County is near zero. So please pray for safe journeys for lots of people today. Uh, 
ask for travel mercies for my trip on Wednesday to Alaska. Let's go, God, in prayer. Holy Lord, you who are full of love and compassion that is so overwhelming, so expansive, that it makes us angry. You who will chase us down to claim us as your own, you who will pursue us until we turn and fall into your loving embrace and your forgiveness and the safety and the peace of the home we find in your arms. We come to you this morning worried about our earth, about the air around us, about the visibility on the coast and the visibility in other parts of the country, about the storms that have blown open some communities who are reeling from the disaster of tornadoes and storms ripping through their towns. We know what it is to have our communities experience bad storms, surprises, trees falling, electricity out, ice storms, the disruption of normal life. We pray your comfort, your peace, your love to enfold all who are confronting our cosmological or ecological uh, environments that are playing havoc with what we think of as normal life. We know that you rest with us, that you are present among all those who are suffering, we pray that they will reach out to you. And that even if they don't know how to do that, there will be others who do, who will come and walk beside them as you would have us do, to comfort them and to carry their load with them as they work through these desperate situations. Lord, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for their medical teams, that they may be inspired by your Holy Spirit that guides us into places we might otherwise not imagine for answers, for unusual or different solutions to problems that are unusual themselves. We pray your comforting presence upon those who are ill and your guiding presence among those who seek to tend them. May they be involved in your triune love, pouring out and being refilled by one another and you. Lord, we pray for this faith community, our church and the United Methodist Church and our annual conference and all annual conferences. We pray for all Christians, Lord, that we may learn to embody your gracious, receiving, welcoming love, that we may learn to be surprised by the love and light 
of God shining in every single person we meet. Help us to set aside our prejudices and the walls that we build and the assumptions that we make so that the power of your seeing may live and dwell in us so that we may love the you in the person before us with the same kind of love that you have shown to us. We pray all these things as we seek to live the way that Jesus lived. And so as Jesus taught us, we pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue with our confession the mystery of god brings the promise of life but we doubt the spirit's power to overcome death the resurrection of jesus christ the son reveals that nothing is impossible with god let us confess our sin and receive new life try in god holy three holy one we confess that we do not know how to look for you. We do not sense your nearness, and if there are angels among us, we are unaware. We do not show the hospitality to strangers that Abraham showed to you. We do not trust that our hardships can be transformed by your spirit. O oh, covenant keeper, forgive us. Let us laugh with joy because your grace has made peace among us. Send us out with this good news so that others will also receive your blessing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ gave his life to save us from our sinfulness. Therefore, since we are justified by Jesus, we have peace with God. Trust the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And now, in case I neglected to say it, happy Father's Day to our fathers. For those whose fatherly relationships are murky or um, um, grievous now with a father passed away. Um, may God's love bring you peace. And may the memory of your father bring you peace and joy in the gifts that your father gave you. Um, I invite you now after having sung your praises and said your praises and heard the word declared and confessed your sin, bring your gifts of gratitude and thanksgiving forward at this time, your gifts and your tithes to God.
blessing on these, our gifts. We ask that you would bless our generosity, that you would multiply these gifts in the furtherance of your kingdom come upon the earth. Amen. mercy and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest upon you and abide within you this day and every day. And may you go forth from this place nurtured in your faith to love and serve the Lord. Amen.